amazing speaker, Elena, who I'm really excited you can see and hear her. So let's give it up for Elena and start this talk. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for waiting. Um, I'm so glad it's feeling good out here tonight because I definitely thought it'd be around 30 something degrees. So I am glad that everybody is here and I'm going to try and convince you that grasslands are the real biome champion of change. Do we have any just grassland fans already coming into the talk tonight? Oh, okay. Holding this. My job should be easy. Okay. So in my undergrad, I actually studied forests. I was a forestry major, and a lot of those forests were in Northern California. So a lot of conifers, a lot of snow, a lot of fun. And then after that, I went on to work in the <laughs> deserts of the Southwest, and I learned how to love to dig soil pits because there are some, there's some really cool dirt out there. I know this is a little... This is a little, actually, I like the effect here that it gives us. This is good. Okay, and it wasn't until I came to Austin that I started working in grasslands because um, some of my research sites are here in the mesquite, um, juniper, savannas of the Edwards Plateau. And when you work in grasslands on the Edwards Plateau, you get to use a wand, which is what I have here. No, I'm just kidding. That's a light meter, so that's how we take light measurements. And I put that picture intentionally in the middle of these other two pictures because in some ways, grasslands are kind of the in-between of forests and deserts. So if we were to very, like, simplify that situation and put those three biomes on a, um, in a space where we're looking at, okay, what is the average temperature of those biomes and what is the average amount of precipitation that they get, it would look something like this. So grasslands really only exist in a space um, in places where they receive temperatures that are anywhere from negative 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius and they receive 500 to about 900 millimeters of precipitation that's rain, snow, sleet, whatever form of moisture per year. And so when you look at continents and areas on certain continents where you might have a forest biome and then also a desert biome, a lot of times there's going to be a grassland biome right in between them. And if you get changes to that grassland biome, like changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, then you might actually see that grassland change into a forest or a desert. So what is a grassland? Let's take a step back here. Anyone have any guesses as to what is a grassland? Yes, in the back. Yes, absolutely, you got it. Uh, the majority of the plant biomass is grass. So you almost got it word for word. An area in which the vegetation is dominated by a nearly continuous cover of grasses. So you're probably thinking, oh, is, that's my lawn. My lawn is a grassland. And actually, we don't normally think of lawns as natural grasslands because, you know, they're very manicured. A lot of times they have ornamental, um, non-native spe plant species, and they tend not to be very biodiverse. Except this is my mom's <laughs> lawn. <laughs> And hers is maybe a little bit more similar to a natural grassland because she has forbs, which are uh, herbaceous flowering plants that are not grasses, um, such as clover and wild strawberries and uh, chickweed and violets. And sometimes her grasses even grow long enough that they have flowers. Who knew that grasses have flowers? Did y'all know that? Some people already knew that. Yeah, grasses are angiosperms. So if you let them grow without mowing them, they can get all sorts of really beautiful types of flowers. And when you have this diversity of plant life, you get a diversity of uh, 
other types of life, animal life, that are looking to eat the plants or looking to eat the animals that are eating the plants. And also you should be getting a diversity of uh, life in the soil. So that could be microbial life, macroinvertebrate life, and all of these things um, are things that we might expect to find in a natural grassland. Okay, so zooming out from my mom's house, on a global scale, 25 to 30% of the Earth's terrestrial surface is covered in grasslands. And that's around about how much the, of the Earth's terrestrial surface is covered in forests, which is about 30%. That's 8.4 billion acres. And we can find grasslands on nearly every single continent, except for Antarctica. All right, and there are many types of grasslands. We call them all sorts of things, depending on where in the world they are and what kinds of plants grow within them. So we have steppes, which you can find in Eurasia, in Eurasia spanning from Eastern Europe into China, all the way into Mongolia. We have meadows in Western Europe. We have downs in Australia. We have the pastas in Hungary. And we have the veld in um, South America, South, South America. And we have the plains in North America stretching up into Canada. We have the um, campos, which are in uh, Brazil and the Llanos, which are in Venezuela. And we have the savanna, which you can find in West Africa, East Africa, um, you can find in parts of Australia as well. And we have the prairie, which is also a part of the plains of Northern America, and the pampas, which is in South America. South, South America, I misspoke. The veld is in South Africa. All right, but broadly, we can separate them into two groups, temperate and tropical. Temperate grasslands have seasons, so we're going to have a cold season and we're going to have a hot season, and we're going to get some precipitation throughout the year. Tropical grasslands are nice. Tropical grasslands are warm year-round, and we're going to have a wet season and a dry season. All right, so I'm going to uh, have you all help me um, put some different grasslands into these two major categories, temperate or tropical. Okay. So if you're good at geography, you might be pretty good at this. Um, the Great Plains of the United States, where you might be able to find the black-footed ferret or the bison or this guy, uh, the greater sage grouse. Temperate or tropical? Let's, let's hear it for temperate. Okay, let's hear it for tropical. Be brave. Okay, y'all are sharp. It is temperate. All right. Uh, the savannas in uh, East Africa, mostly in Tanzania, the, Sa the Serengeti, pretty famous grassland, where you might find zebras and giraffe and elephants and cheetahs what do we think temperate <laughs> or tropical all right all right all right y'all are on it okay um this is uh the cerrado which i actually got to see recently is awesome um where we might have the maned wolf or the capybara, the world's largest rodent, or this guy, the giant anteater. Do we think that is temperate or tropical? Temperate? Tropical? Ooh. That was even a mix-up and y'all got it. Okay, great. Okay, and then the, your, uh, the great step where we might be able to find, gosh, the speckled ground squirrel. <laughs> Or um, the, some wild horses, the Shavoltsky horse, or the Saiga antelope. Do we think that's temperate? Yeah. 
tropical. All right, it's temperate. Y'all got it. One last one. A golf course. Temperate? Tropical? It's not a grassland? Okay, you're right. We're not going to count this as a natural grassland, so let's get it out of here. All right, so one of the coolest parts, one of the coolest things I think about grasslands is their origin story. So how did grasslands first come to be? We have to go back about 30 million years ago. So actually that's fairly recent for the origin of a biome and the history of Earth. And that's gonna bring us to the mid Cenozoic period. And at that time, we were seeing a bunch of climatic shifts. So things were getting drier, things were getting hotter and uh, that led to buildup of plant material and we saw more fires. Another thing that was going on at that time was that there was a divers diversification of these large grazing mammals, which had a lot to do with the fact that the species that um, could survive these you know, hotter, drier conditions, these fires and the grazing um, were leading to their uh, proliferation and were creating these grasslands. And so there was kind of this feedback of uh, grasslands uh, species becoming, um, being able to thrive in these types of conditions and supporting more types of grazing animals. And so that is actually one of my favorite stories too, which my advisor, I, I'm pretty sure it told me, um, was this history of uh, this, this relationship, this co-evolution between uh, pre like prehistoric horses and uh, grasses. And so if you ever wonder why are a horse's teeth so big, it might, it, it is probably because we believe it is because they would graze these grasses and in response to that, the grasses would produce, or the grasses that would survive had more silica in them. So grasses actually have silica like glass in them. And that's actually what you see right here are these little glass silica spikes. And so then in response, the, t uh, the horses that would survive or would be able to, you know, eat more of the spiky grass were the ones with these longer teeth. And then in response to that grazing with these longer teeth, the grasses that would survive had more silica and so on and so forth. And that's what we call a co-evolutionary arms race. And so you kind of see this uh, back and forth between these two species. So that's, that might be why we have spiky grass and horses with long teeth. Okay, so I really want to play this grassland game, but I was trying so hard to think of a name of, for a grassland game, and I couldn't think of anything except grassland game. And I thought, wow, that is the worst name for any kind of game you might ever want to play. So I asked ChatGPT, I said, I said, what is similar to grassland game, but not quite <laughs> grassland game and its response was so good that I included all of the alternative names here. So I'm going to let you decide what game you're playing, what you're going to call it. We have Turfs of Tenacity, <laughs> Sod Showdown, Savannah Survivors or Savannah Sur Survivor, uh, Fescue Fiesta, and my favorite, Prairie Prowess Pursuit. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to need you to choose your player. And this game is really going to help us get into some of the adaptations that different grassland species um, have that allow them to face the different kinds of disturbances that um, are associated with grasslands. So, player one. The yellow evening primrose. You have these large, beautiful, fragrant flowers. You open them at night, and you are in the buttercup family. 
player two, little blue stem. That's you as this um, brown, uh, that little brown bunch there. But in your full glory, you are a blue green, a really distinct uh, blue green color. And you're a real sturdy grass. Yellow bunch grass, you are a creative. Your uh, seed head looks like a turkey foot. Uh, in Texas Blue Bonnet, you are classic, icon. Um, you are the first to show up in the spring. You make good friends with your soil microbial neighbors, um, and they help you fix uh, nitrogen in the soil and uh, spread nutrients for everybody. And you're yeah, a true neighbor. So take a minute, think about who you want to be, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to it. So. Let me see, so I can keep you accountable. Let me see where my yellow evening primroses are. Woo! And just do a little wave, okay? <laughs> Great, we got some buttercups. Let me see where my little blue stems are. Okay. Yellow bunch grass. Oh, we got a lot of people have a lot of faith in yellow bunch grass. Texas blue bonnet. Yes, okay, that's what I thought. <clears throat> So if you can, I think as I walk through this, um, you don't have to stand, no, maybe just either take on some kind of shape with your body that in some way resembles your uh, species or maybe make some kind of motion as if you were a, a grassland species, uh, you know, waving in the wind. But our setting is essential and you don't have to keep it up, it's okay. Just you know maybe so um your setting is a central texas grassland mesquite uh juniper savanna on edwards plateau and it is uh, a beautiful spring day oh I'm sorry i need a little more lead up um it's a beautiful spring day and you are just minding your own business everybody is thriving when you hear it, a chomp, 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 and you start shaking in your roots because you look up and you see this Texas Longhorn and you know it's lunchtime and she looks hungry, okay? So, round one, yellow evening primrose, where are you? There they are, okay. You are just too tasty. <laughs> You're just too delicious, and you do not survive this round. Okay. Um, where are my blue bonnets? You seem a little. I know there are more blue bonnets. Blue bonnets. You, you do actually look tasty, but you have chemical defenses, um, alkaloids in your leaves and in your seeds. And so she does not even bother with you because if she ate too much of you, she would absolutely get a stomach ache. So you are safe this round. All right, now little blue stem and yellow bunch grass. Okay, you all got chomped for sure. But you have the ability to re-sprout because you have apical meristems at the base of the blade, at, the, at your blades of, yeah, on your blades. And so even if you get chomped almost all the way down, you will be able to bounce back, okay? So you have also made it to the next round. All right, so everybody is looking a little bit chomped, but, these three of us still surviving, but you know, summer's coming, things are getting hotter, drier, everything's getting a little crunchy, parched. Everybody is parched. Um, blue bonnets. Blue bonnets, we still got the blue bonnets with us, right? You have a long tap root 
So you can actually get to layers of the soil where there's water that nobody else can get to. Okay, so you survive and you make it to the next round. Um, little blue stem. Okay, little blue stem. You and yellow bunch grass. This yellow bunch grass. You, you all, yellow bunch grass. You all also have some specialized root systems. You, well, you have really extensive web-like root systems. And so you can move through the soil and find water. Except, uh, let's see, who, who is it? It's, it's little blue stem. You were a little more palatable, a little more tasty to the longhorn than uh, the yellow bunch grass was. And so that grazing pressure combined with this drought pressure, you just can't handle it. You don't make it to the next round. But I am going to take my yellow bunch grass and my blue bonnets on to round three. This is the final round, OK? It was dry. It was a windy day. The conditions were just right. It was hot. And we had, and you know what else? We had a high fuel load from all that standing dead little blue stem. And so we had a fire roll through. Uh, no one survives, okay? <laughs> It is, it is burnt to a crisp. There was no place to go. Blue bonnets, and uh, uh, who else was it? Yellow, yellow, yellow bunch grass. <laughs> there was no place to go. But you know what? When a fire comes through, there's something about all that space that opens up, and also all the nutrients that are brought from that ash that grassland species tend to really like. And so with some time, after a few more rains, all species return. Uh, yellow bunch grass, luckily you had rhizomes, underground stems, and you were able to re-sprout. Both of my flower species, you have seeds that have hard outer, uh, outer shells, and they actually need scarification or some kind of uh, physical, um, some kind of physical alteration to their seeds for water to get in before they can grow. And so that fire helped break down that outer seed coat. And my little blue stem, your fluffy seeds flew in on the wind, landed on this nutrient rich soil and were able to reestablish. Okay. All right. Thank you for playing Savannah Survivor. You all made it through. You're great sports. Champions. Okay, so in a way, in some of my own work, um, and some of the work we're doing at the lab, we have a little bit of a Savannah survivor situation going over at a local field site at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And so we are working in a grassland, and we are applying different types of disturbances to see how the plant community responds. So one type is biomass removal. We get rid of all of the plants, all of the vegetation. One kind is nutrient addition. We add in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. One kind of disturbance is drought. We intercept 50% of the rain that's coming in and the precipitation. And uh, one type of disturbance is fire. We will be applying fire to some of our plots that we have out at this experimental site. And so we're not just looking at one at the response of the community to one type of disturbance, we're also really interested in the interactions. So what's going to happen to the plant community if we remove biomass and then we add nutrients? What if we remove biomass, add nutrients, and then apply drought? Is that going to give us a different plant community response than if we just apply nutrients and then add drought? What if we apply nutrients, add drought, and then set it all on fire? Okay, so you get the point. We're really interested in how these 
um, different types of disturbances are going to affect our plant communities. And in a way we're asking about, you know, we, we talked about how grasslands are adapted to change and are adapted to disturbance, but um, these days we, 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 we've kind of got a changing change going on. So the disturbance regimes that they've evolved within are looking different in a lot of cases. So we're getting new types of disturbances that they're not that the plants within the system are not evolved to, or we're getting um, disturbances at frequencies that they are not evolved to. Um, and because of some of these pressures today, just 1%, just 1% of Texas's original native grasslands remain intact. And that scales up. Uh, so in the United States, we only see 5% of our original grasslands. Globally, 10% of our original grasslands. And so some people call them the most threatened and the least protected eco uh, biomes. Biome. Because no one ever tells you, oh yeah, you know, save the environment, go plant a grass. Maybe they have, but I've never heard it before. <laughs> Okay, grasslands are kind of on the margin when we come to thinking about uh, environmental protection efforts. But I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons why I think we can, or how I think we can uh, utilize the potential of grasslands to address some global environmental changes that we see these days. So, carbon dioxide, it's a greenhouse gas. Right? Greenhouse gases, we need them because they help keep the earth warm and keep us from turning into Pluto. But also, if we have too many greenhouse gases in the environment, that can be a problem. And so grassland plants, like many plants in different types of ecosystems, take in carbon dioxide because they need it for photosynthesis, right? And then they put that carbon into their above ground biomass and leaves, stems, flowers, seeds. But most of the carbon in grassland ecosystem goes below ground into roots and root exudates, which are um, compounds, organic carbon compounds dissolved in water and uh, microbial mutualists. And a a favorite type of microbial mutualist for me is our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Not the kind of fungi that produces mushrooms above ground, but one that is very common. It's actually, it associates with 80 to 90% of land plants. And uh, it has been associated with plants for 430 million years because it was actually this mutualism that helped uh, the trans, the the movement of plants living in water to plants living on land. And I brought this up because plants exchange carbon that they get through photosynthesis, turn it into sugars. They give it to their um, fungal mutualists in exchange for nutrients and water. And so that when that carbon is given to those AMF, then it also goes into the soil in um, the form of the AMF biomass, as well as the AMF exudates as well. Yeah. So all in all, grasslands can be really awesome carbon sinks because they will hold that carbon in the soil where it's protected if something, say a fire comes through and burns the above ground biomass, we still have that carbon sequestered underground. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water and then I need to tell you something. <laughs> Did you know? Okay, I don't know, I don't know. You're gonna know. Did you know? You eat grass all the time. I bet you eat grass most days. 
Can anyone tell me what kind of grass they eat? Yell, yell it out. Say it again. Sorry, say it again. Wheat. Okay, wheat is a great one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So wheat, so breads. Yes, bagels, pasta. Okay, another one? Corn. Okay, amazing. Yes, corn and rice. Rice is a really good one. Rice doesn't typically grow in uh, grasslands, what we think of as grasslands, but yes, rice is a grass. Corn, what's another one? Oat. Oat, yes, absolutely. And you got all the ones I was thinking of, except for one. Garlic? Barley. Barley, not, okay, barley is a grass. Bamboo. Sorghum? Bamboo is sorghum. I was thinking of some kind of sweetener. So sugarcane or sorghum for molasses or also corn for corn syrup. Okay, so I want to make the connection here with something called a crop wild relative. Has anyone heard of a crop wild relative before? It's okay, I won't put you on the spot. So that is a plant. We can kind of think about it as like a wild cousin to a commonly cultivated crop. So uh, the definition is a plant species that grows in the wild that is closely related to domesticated crop species. And they're really cool because if they're closely related enough, then we can breed these wild relatives with our commonly cultivated crops and we can use the useful traits that they might have and integrate them into our crops. And a lot of times, you know, these crop wild relatives, they are, they are um, adapted to their local environments. And so they might have traits such as drought tolerance, pathogen resistance, heat tolerance, or traits we don't even know about that could be really useful for the future of our food system. So these are some different crops that have wild crop, crop wild relatives living in Texas, in Texas grasslands. Onion, sweet pea, quinoa, pumpkin, lettuce, zucchini, and tomatoes. But when was the last time you went into a grassland and it looked like this? Probably never, right? So these crop wild relatives tend to be a little more inconspicuous. So here's one that grows locally. Can anyone guess what commonly cultivated crop this is related to? Tomato? How did you, how did you know that? Tomato and potato and eggplant. How did you know that? It's a nightshade. It is. It's a silver leaf nightshade, Solanum alignifolium. Amazing. Yes. Um, right, so a lot of times, though, they don't look, they don't necessarily look like the things that might end up on our dinner plates, um, but they still have those genes that can be useful. So, in a way, protecting grasslands helps protect our food. Okay, so by now, you might be feeling hungry or you might be feeling like you want to go visit a grassland. So I thought I would just leave you with a list of local grasslands. Uh, in Texas, we can find them in seven different geographic regions, including the Blackland Prairies, the Coastal Prairie, the Rolling Plains, the High Plains, the South Texas Plains, the Trans Pecos, and uh, the Edwards Plateau. So very, very local one. And here's the picture of the Blackland Prairie because I haven't been, but I've heard it's beautiful. Um, and that is actually it. So thank you so much for bearing with me here and I'll take any questions. Do I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yay! So we have.
Take two. Yes. Yay. Do you have a question? Yes. Do you have a question? We might have to. I can, we'll see. I want to door, but the chicken will shut down. <laughs> okay. Yeah, pass it. Uh, my question is, like, you had said in America, it's like five, we only have like five percent of the original grassland, and then in Texas, it's only one percent that's intact. It, when you say original, is that, I guess, what is yeah, time, like, how far do you go back to consider something original? That's a really good question, and, um, I so, okay, so the question is when I say, okay, so only 1% of Texas grasslands are intact, you know, of original grasslands are intact, or only 5% of the US grasslands. And honestly, I'm not sure. I don't know if we, you know, we have predictions of how much of uh, the states were covered in grasslands as of millions of years ago, or if we're thinking since, you know, um, like written records, and then we're comparing to that. My guess would be the latter, but um, I'm not for sure on that. Yeah, good question. A lot of, yeah, a lot of it now is, but that doesn't count as as original grassland. Do you think? Yeah. So he's saying that. So a lot of um, yeah. So. That's true. So one of the big threats to grasslands is agriculture because grassland soils are really rich. And so they, uh, it's beneficial to replace, you know, to, to farmers to, and this just has happened historically that um, natural grasslands get replaced with agricultural fields. So a lot of those once grass, natural grasslands are now cotton and corn. That's what he's saying. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. How do you measure the health of a grassland? How do you measure the health of a grassland? That's a great question. Yeah, I think, you know, so it depends on who you ask. Um, and it depends on um, what your manage if you're grassland manager a land manager and you're managing the grassland for uh, certain functions you know uh, for example to support pollinators um, then you might be really interested in how much pollinator biodiversity you have or maybe you're just interested in how much plant biodiversity you have or um, maybe you're interested in uh, some of its ecosystem functions such as how does it filter out the water that comes through that ends up in the creek that's running nearby? You know, how clean is that water? And so I think you can use a bunch of those metrics of ecosystem function, including biodiversity as a, as a function to measure the health of a grassland. But you're also thinking within the context of the type of grassland you're working in, right? If that grassland uh, doesn't ne hasn't necessarily been functioning as like a hasn't had a whole bunch of species in it for some time. And so, uh, and then you just start planting species for the sake of making it more biodiverse because you think that's gonna make it healthier. That might be a little misguided. So it really, it really depends on the, on the type of um, grassland that you're working in. That's what I would say, yeah. But common metrics, yeah, biodiversity, different, uh, pollinator diversity, animal diversity, things like that. Yeah. Yes. What's your favorite grass and why? <laughs> okay, so I, I, when I came here, I, thought, I, said, I told my friend, I said, I need to think of a favorite grass quick because I don't have one. <laughs> I am a vine person. I am a vine person. But... Um, I decided that my favorite grass, because I was preparing for this, is the side oats grama, because it is the Texas state grass, and it also looks pretty cute. It's got a bunch of its seed heads hanging from the side, on just on one similar side, and so, um, yeah, that's probably my favorite grass. Another question? Yes. 
what should people with lawns do? Because it seems like grasslands have a lot of benefits and you know, your mom has her Forbes and, and all of that. But like, if people who have lawns wanna like do better than just having boring lawn grass, what should they do? Uh, so I'm really not here to tell anyone that they can't have their lawn. Cause I know people get, you know, people also really love their lawns. But if, um, what would I do if I, if I was trying to make my lawn maybe more like a natural grassland? Mm -hmm. I would mow less. <laughs> I don't mow that much right now. I would probably mow less. Probably this, I feel like this is like my mom's formula. Don't mow a whole bunch. Don't apply fertilizer. Um, don't apply any harsh chemicals and I'll tell you what she has mushrooms in her yard she had she got a bobcat in her yard for the first time the other day um, oh this is another one she does um, when you do get a nice layer let a nice layer of leaves accumulate and then mow over them but leave them so it's like a mulch that ends up um, staying on the yard and keeping moisture in. That's another thing she does, though. Any other questions? Do you, yeah. Are there any good um, foraging books like Eating Your Way Across Grasslands? <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. Are there any good foraging books Eating Your Ways Across Grasslands? I don't know, but I would love to find out if you if you find I, I I'm sorry I can't give you any recommendations but um, I know there's like a foraging Texas book um, it's yellow and it's not grassland specific but it would be cool if there was a grassland specific one I'm sure there is does anyone know of any okay all right y'all have been real troopers any last questions. Okay, thank you so much for the time and thank you have a great night. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was like a really fun and funny talk. I actually